We welcome all of you to our live stream worship on this fifth Sunday in the season of Eastertide. Below you will find links to our worship bulletin and to our online giving. Our guest preacher this week is the Reverend A.J. Heine, who's the rector of Trinity Church in Stanton. And our guest musician is Jen Bellina, who is the organist and choir director also at Trinity Stanton. Our worship begins this morning on page 355. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one. Have mercy upon us. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, whom truly to know is everlasting life, grant us so perfectly to know your Son, Jesus Christ, to be the way, the truth, and the life, that we may steadfastly follow his steps in the way that leads to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading from the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to his chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep he was led to the slaughter and like a lamb silent before its shearer. So he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? From his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom may I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak and started talking about scripture, and he proclaimed the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, he came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus and was passing through the region. He proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Here ends the reading. Our psalm appointed for today is Psalm 22, verses 24 through 30. My praise is of him in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the presence of those who worship him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied, and those who seek the Lord shall praise him. May your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations shall bow down before him. For kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. To him alone all who sleep in the earth bow down in worship. All who go down to dust fall before him. My soul shall live for him. My descendants shall serve him. They shall be known as the Lord's forever. They shall come and make known to a people yet unborn the saving deeds that he has done. Our 
A reading from 1 John. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. Here ends the reading.
Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus told his disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you I do not speak on my own. But the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Good morning. My name is A.J. Heine. I am the rector here at Trinity Episcopal Church in Stanton. Um, more frequently known as the new guy, but I'm glad to be here, glad to be invited um, to, to preach to who I can only imagine are the people and families of the Diocese of Southwest Virginia. It is good to be with you. Uh, what you may not know is that my wife, Shannon, and I moved to Stanton from New Orleans, New Orleans, Louisiana. And let me tell you, that place is a jungle. Or... More precisely, a swamp. And that's not meant to be political or social commentary so much as climatological truth. Maybe you've seen the photographs of the old shotgun houses covered and shrouded by creeping vines. Things grow like crazy down there. But getting particular plants to grow in specific places and with desired fruits or flowers requires attention and work. That was certainly our experience when we planted Confederate jasmine on our patio. I had dreams of its branches filling the pergola overhead, creating shade and blocking rain and providing fragrant blossoms. So we bought four plants, one for each post, and we watered and waited but not for very long. They grew quickly, but not exactly where we wanted them. It seemed like I'd leave for work in the morning and came home in the evening to find some rogue branches pushing into the soffit of the house or wrapping around the gutters. You'd take a nap on a Saturday afternoon and wake up to find a couple of wild shoots heading straight for the neighbor's house. It became clear that the jasmine would require constant care and attention and redirecting in order to accomplish the purpose we had in mind. So we committed to the vision and regularly pruned and trimmed. We carefully removed parts of the plant that were headed in the wrong direction and that redirected the nutrients so that other parts of the vine grew even faster. New shoots were gently woven among other parts of the vine and pieces of the overhead structure. And eventually, the branches became this indistinguishable mass 
and the four plants came together to produce a canopy of identical, fragrant blossoms. I'm guessing that Jesus knew something about vines. He prepares the disciples for his departure by giving them this image. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. And again, he says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Jesus understands that vines require tending to. He accepts the reality that unfruitful branches need to be removed. And similarly, fruitful branches require pruning to maximize their fruit bearing. The fruit of the vine, the purpose and meaning of the vineyard is too important to be neglected. So God lovingly, consistently, diligently, tenderly, and wisely tends to the vine. Both God the Father and God the Son are committed to fruit bearing. And so they know that pruning is to be expected. Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. We shouldn't be surprised or scared, resistant or resentful when our branches get trimmed. Because it's not about our branches, but God's fruit. We can expect and hopefully accept that in our lives and in our congregations, changes will come in order that we can glorify God by bearing much fruit and becoming his disciples. We should all expect some pruning in our lives and in our congregation. Uh, here's an example. There was, uh, there was this rector, not just for, the, for purposes of clarification, not me. This is not an autobiographical story. There was an imaginary rector, let's say, who calls together all the members of the altar guild, and she says to them, I have some good news and some bad news. The bad news is that you are all here to four dismissed from the altar guild. And then she pauses for effect until someone eventually asked, well, what's the good news? To which she answers, if any of you would like to be reinstated, all you have to do is make an appointment and come and tell me why the altar guild is meaningful to you. And you'll be immediately reinstated. Some people thanked her, saying, you know, I got on the altar guild when I was 22 years old because my mother asked me to, and I loved that time with her for many years, but I really don't so much anymore, and I think I could use my time and talents in a better way in other areas of the church. Other people from the altar guild thought it over, made an appointment, and said to this new rector, you know, I thought about it. In that quiet time on Saturday mornings, feeds my soul. I wish I could do it more often. That ministry is vital to me. There are times where in order to be fruitful, the things that we have been doing, we have to let go of. I know there's a lot of consternation about the decline in church attendance. We hear the latest Gallup poll that less than half of Americans now claim to be a member of a church, mosque, or synagogue, and we feel threatened. We are tempted to go into survival mode, ready to fight to the death with every ounce of our strength, with every resource, habit, or tradition that has sprouted from the vine. We can become so committed to our particular vine, whether that's our congregation or favorite program or ministry, so committed to it that we lose sight of God's larger mission and hope for us and for all of creation. Instead of protecting our vine, we would be better off. God's mission would be better served if we would listen to Jesus' words to his disciples, both then and for all of us in these in-between times. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit 
by itself, unless it abides in me, neither can you unless you abide in me. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit. What if instead of protecting our particular branches, we committed to or recommitted to abiding in, being rooted in, making our abode with, and trusting the spirit of the crucified and risen one to work through us and on us? What if we adopted a posture of openness to being cleansed, pruned, streamlined by the Holy Spirit for fruitfulness? It's happening. I've heard recently of some of the congregations in our diocese who have done exactly that. They realized that they could do more for God's mission in the world by giving up some of their independence and combining their resources. Some of their normal ways of doing church had to be trimmed. But they were also more aware than ever of their rootedness in Christ. And they are bearing fruit in their particular mission field. They are working with God's purpose in mind to bear fruit and become disciples. Brothers and sisters, have no fear for tomorrow. The truth is that God is committed to the fruitfulness of the church. At the end of the day, it's about the root and the fruit, not the branches. So while we love our branches, let us not withhold them from the loving care of God's Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, and prune away the parts of us the parts of us as individuals, as congregations, as your church that are not bearing fruit. Help us to remain rooted in Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life, and work through us to bear the fruits of your kingdom. Let us affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life for the world to come. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you have promised to hear what we pray in the name of your Son. Therefore, in confidence and trust, we pray for the church. Breathe fresh life into your people. Give us power to reveal Christ in word and action. We pray for the world. Awaken in us a sense of wonder for the earth and all that is in it. Teach us to care creatively for its resources. We pray for the community. Give grace to all those whose lives are linked with ours. 
May we serve Christ in one another and love as he loves us. We pray for those in need. God of hope, comfort, and restore all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. May they know the power of your healing love. We remember those who have died and those who mourn. We praise you for all your saints who have entered into your eternal joy. May their example inspire and encourage us. Lord, you have called us to serve you. Grant that we may walk in your presence, your love in our hearts, your truth in our minds, your strength in our wills, until at the end of our journey we know the joy of our homecoming and the welcome of your embrace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And now let us pray in the words our Lord and Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And the blessing, mercy, and grace of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day and forever. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you.